hi welcome back to my channel if you're new here welcome i hope that you stick around and take a listen to what i have to share today i want to talk about suicide ideology and i'm going to talk about my experiences with suicide attempts it is going to be a very triggering video so if you have mental health problems mental illnesses and you are at a point where you will be triggered by the talk of suicide please don't watch this video not today or come back when you are well with that being said let's get into it so if you're new here i am wahiga and i am an alcoholic i also have bipolar type 2 depression and bipolar is basically a mood disorder it's a disorder of the moods that is the best way i can explain it where your moods are up and down up and down the difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 is bipolar 1 has mania and bipolar 2 has hypomania so bipolar one that's the one i think allegedly kanye west has allegedly where you get manic so your mania goes really really high and for about a week or so you can be thinking on genius levels you know you unlock your creativity you unlock your mind you really go on a tangent and you can actually be on the verge of psychosis or actually be psychotic. Now, what inevitably happens is you end up crashing. You end up crashing into a depression. And that's when you can get suicidal. I have bipolar type 2. Bipolar type 2, I go hypomania. So I don't go manic, like all the way. But I go hypomania where I have racing thoughts. I can't sleep. I do think at a higher level, I would say higher level, well, I'm more productive. I'm definitely more productive. I have a lot of energy. I can get things done really quickly. I talk really fast. I'm restless. I'm also high risk. I'm a recovering alcoholic. So for instance, in a normal day when I am well, I would not, for instance, walk into a bar and chill there the whole day to watch a soccer match because I don't feel comfortable in bars. Those are PPTs, those are people, places, and things. Those are triggers that I really wouldn't be comfortable around alcohol or around people drinking that much. I mean, I can be around it, but when I'm well, why would I just go chill in a bar when I can go chill in a coffee house? When I'm in a hypomanic mood or hypomanic episode, rather, I will do things like go chill in a bar. I will engage in high risk activities. That's when I will pick up the phone and call an ex or just do really stupid things. Things that are very risky in the moment, but without hindsight, I, like I don't have any hindsight. I don't have any break. I say whatever comes to mind. I have no filters and I just go. I have no consequences. And inevitably, I crash. Inevitably, I crash and when I crash I go into a depression so the hypomania for me normally lasts about five seven days and then the the crash comes and I get into a depressive episode and mine lasts for between four months to six months and out of a year it's awful I've talked to people who have had depressive episodes for two three years relentless Lee that is just a brief background on bipolar but kindly do more research if you want to really understand the ins and outs of bipolar disorder. Why I talk about suicide and suicide ideation. So suicide ideation is basically fantasizing, thinking, glamorizing, planning your suicide. That is not a good place to be in. And I'll tell you now, from my point of view and my opinion, when you're sick, when you're mentally ill, when you're not well, you start doing that yes normal people i've come to realize and i've come to hear this through my psychiatrist normal people do think about suicide but it comes and goes it comes in they think about it it goes when you're sick the thought of suicide comes it lingers it stays it takes root in your mind and then you actually sit down and you get a sense of relief from planning and executing an exit plan because you're kind of relieved like you found a way out of your pain in essence and i know this sounds very macabre and this sounds really morbid but let's have this conversation let's have this conversation let's be real the suicide rates in kenya are extremely high especially among the youth and the topic of suicide is something that is 
so taboo everywhere you go around the world it's not just in kenya it's not just in africa it's not just in the west everywhere you go nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room but people are struggling with this illness suicide ideation it's okay to have been feeling this way it's okay to have had the thought come linger take root what's not okay is not to do something about it please reach out reach out to someone tell someone what you're planning to do i know that you feel a sense of relief like finally i have my plans down i've written them down i've written my will my last testament um all the plans are in order i've stored away the money i have done this i have done that and you're thinking that this is the only way out the people here that i will leave behind will be much better off if i left them here and when you get into that state and i know this place very well this voice that talks to you talks in your own voice and it tells you things like your loved ones will be so much better off if you're not here at least your loved ones will feel better they will hurt for a bit but they'll be better off in the long term at least the burden will be off their shoulder instead of you being here and depressed all the time for me it's my parents so my parents are constantly worrying about me constantly what is Wahiga done now has she relapsed has she done this has she done that and i'm like when i get in that state of mind i'm like yeah i'll be relieving them of these things you know i'll be relieving them of that burden and it is such a sick way of thinking it is a very sick way of thinking because it's not the truth it is literally taking the inventory of the people that you love it is literally taking the feelings it is taking what they would feel if you were not here and justifying it to yourself to give you gas to give you fuel to do what you want to do and it's not right don't make excuses for your loved ones your loved ones will be devastated i've seen firsthand what suicide can do to a family it is absolutely devastating nobody talks about it nobody talks about it like it's that painful nobody talks about it it's so deep like you knew the person was there right everybody knows this person existed everybody knows this person was there and you know when someone passes away in an accident or from an illness or something and you know suicide is definitely the end result of mental illness however when someone passes away from an illness like cancer or something people are able to look back and talk about them and be at some sort of peace with the life they lived and how that person passed away but when a person passes away from suicide the family that is left behind the people that are left behind cannot speak they cannot speak about that person the parents that are left behind cannot speak about that person and it's not because they're not in there they're not thinking about them constantly they don't feel them in their hearts it's just too damn painful when you ask about that person people just don't want to go into it and so that's the one side so if you're trying to rationalize your thoughts you can't rationalize analyzing yourself and that's why i'm saying the thoughts may seem so tempting because the thoughts are talking in your own voice and they're saying things like you will lift the burden off they will be so much better off if you are not here everybody will be happier and it's simply not true circumstances don't get better if you're not here what they often say about suicide is you're making a permanent decision over a temporary situation and while having depression i wouldn't say is temporary I mean having bipolar type 2 the depression is real okay the, the the depression is real it goes on and on and on and on for many months there are many months where it's just complete darkness and I'm in the abyss and I can't get a break you know I just can't get a break and I feel like I'm tired I can't do it you know the thoughts are just continuous you know the suicidal thought a continuous and I I just beg God to relieve me of of the pain but at the same time he does whether it's 6 hours of being able to sleep and not having those thoughts anymore whether it's 2 days of being able to be 
energetic and just get up and shower and not feel so anxious and depressed for just two days. I'm given a break. In between those blocks of depression, I'm given a break where I can just... Uh, barely collect myself and then carry on but i get it get how tempting it can be so let me get to my experiences with suicide attempts my first suicide attempt was when i was still drinking that was in 2015 i had just come out of rehab and we'd come back home my parents had picked me up from their rehab and i knew i knew in my heart in my soul in my gut that I could not stop drinking. I tried, I tried to not drink. I tried to white knuckle it. I, I really <clears throat> held on for dear life, but I started drinking again after a month. And six months later, I was just tired. I was tired of being in this limbo where my life was getting worse. I couldn't live with alcohol. I couldn't live without it. And it wasn't working the same way it used to. Like, there's something about going to rehab and then starting to drink again that just completely takes the, the fun out of it. I don't know. It, it just stopped. Maybe it's just me, but it, it stopped working. It, it stopped working. It stopped being my medicine. In December of 2015, I took a bunch of pills from outpatient treatment that I had gotten from that rehab. And I was determined just to end my life and I remember thinking like I just want to sleep forever and next thing I know I woke up in a hospital bed tied down and when I tried to get up my back was like an excruciating pain and I blacked out from the pain again and then when I woke up again there were doctors around me and nurses and they were telling me that I had been having seizures and oh it, it was a mess I didn't understand why I was in hospital. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand how I got to the hospital. Apparently, I was taken in an ambulance. Um, my my folks had found me unconscious in my room and um, comatose. And it was a very sad state of affairs. Yeah, it's very sad uh, that they had to see me like that. It, it was bad. You know, my, my time in hospital was really bad. I stayed there for, I don't even know how long it was, like five, seven days. Um, it was high dependency unit. I came back home and it was agreed that I would stop drinking. I couldn't stop. As soon as I had enough energy, you know, they'd done a lumbar puncture in my back. My back was in a lot of pain. I couldn't sleep at night. But as soon as like I could walk properly again, you know, I just went to my locals and looked for more alcohol. You know, completely powerless over alcohol. It was my medicine. It was just like my kryptonite. And then 2016, New Year's Eve, I think it was, I tried again. And that's the time I did a video on this. where The video, Jesus Christ saved me from hell. Yeah, I... Now, these pills that I had from the rehab, well, I didn't finish all of them. So I continued on them this time around. I didn't exactly OD, but um, basically my spirit went to hell. I was paralyzed. My whole body was paralyzed. And that was awful. That was really just... And I, I said out loud in the name of Jesus, you know, save me from this place. And I came back to my body. And I didn't go to hell that day. And the third time I attempted was in sobriety. Yeah, this is interesting because I have had two attempts in sobriety, in sobriety. And I've also been hospitalized three times. I've been to the mental ward three times in sobriety. I was diagnosed with bipolar in 2018. I got sober in 2017. Been to the psych ward 2018, 2019, 2020. I'm not embarrassed about it. You know, why I went to the psych ward is because I was having suicidal thoughts and ideations and I was about to act on them. Basically, I had a mental relapse. So I think in the medical fraternity, when you're having suicidal thoughts, it means that you've mentally relapsed. And that's when they check you into hospital. So because you, they need to regulate you and you need to be watched. So yeah, I got sober and I thought I was going to be fine. I thought I was going to be great. You know, life is going to be great. I've given up booze. Oh, Oh, ho, ho. don't get me wrong. Life is great. But and however, mental illness is real and bipolar type 2 is severe. So got diagnosed with this depression in 2018 after a very bad bout of depression. Now, I didn't have alcohol in my system, so I wasn't medicating myself 
with anything. I wasn't numbing myself with anything. And anyways, the alcohol ceased to work anymore. It stopped working a long time before I stopped drinking. So about 10 months into my sobriety is when I was hit with that awful depression and I just could not stop crying. I could not stop crying. I was inconsolable. It felt like a heavy, heavy weight on my head and my head was pounding and emotionally I just felt so weak. If someone looked at me, I just wanted to cry. If if someone talked to if someone talked to me, I just wanted to cry. And normally I'm not that person. I'm just not that person. When people think of bipolar, they think like ha ha ha. Like one minute you're ha ha ha. The next minute you're like that <laughs> that's not what it is at all. You know, it's it's you know, it's not like that at all. But I, I definitely went through these episodes where I could not control my emotions. I was just completely in despair, completely depressed. The most I could do in a day was shower and go to an AA meeting. That was it. Because I was petrified of drinking again. Still am. That was about it. So that's when I was put on antidepressants alone. And then on antidepressants, I got better. Like within three days, I was like... But the problem is I was on antidepressants alone. So I went overshot the mark and I went really high up and I was like really happy like sickly happy and then I crashed inevitably like after six months just on antidepressants because I needed to be on a mood stabilizer when you're bipolar you kind of need to be on an antidepressant and a mood stabilizer but until that time my moods would just yo-yo so I was put in hospital the first time in 2018 I stayed for like a week then the second time I was put in 2019 You know, I was in school, I was writing my exams, but I had to tell my lecturers, like, I'm having suicidal thoughts, I need to be in hospital, I don't know what else to tell you. And that's what happened, until I was set right. So, medication, you know, by the time I'm getting to hospital, let me tell you, I haven't slept in, that time I hadn't slept in eight days. I was just very wired, you know, I was really just wired. Uh, My thoughts were racing like madness. I was really hyper, engaging in a lot of high-risk activities, sober by the grace of God, but really engaging in some seriously high-risk activities that could have cost me my sobriety and was just bouncing off walls basically until I crashed. Then I needed to be medicated strongly and regulated. And when I came back home, my medication had to be given to me by my parents because I couldn't be trusted with my medicine. And then giving me certain medication like Valium. Oh, Valium is not good for me. It hits that alcoholic spot in me. Things like Valium and Domicum, they hit that alcoholic spot in me and I will abuse it. I was supposed to take Valium three times a day. And what I started doing is instead of taking the one for the morning, And instead of taking the one for the afternoon, I would just keep them all till the evening so that I could really feel mellow. And you know, that's abuse of drugs. I was supposed to wean myself off from 20 mgs within three weeks. I found myself going higher. Yeah, it's not a good thing. You know, don't give alcoholics Valium. For anxiety, yeah. And then my third attempt was in 2021. That's my last recollection. And I I took a bunch of pills again and um, it was really bad. It was really bad. I was really sad and depressed and just done. Because, you know, the one thing that hits my brain when I go through these suicidal ideations is I can't drink again. Like I can't pick up a drink again. For me to drink is to die. And it's to die like in the worst way. Like I know if I pick up a drink, it won't be I'm dead. You know, it, it's, it's I'm picking up a drink and then everything that we have worked for, everything that I've worked for, everything will be stripped one by one by one by one until everything is gone again. You know, that's how alcoholism works. It takes from you everything. It doesn't take from you everything at once. It takes bits and pieces of you slowly and painfully. And I don't wanna do that again. (laughs) I don't wanna go through that again. My rock bottom was so painful. It was was so bad um, that I don't wanna go through that again. So you'll hear a lot of people in recovery say, I would rather die than pick up a drink. This is just real talk. I'd rather die than pick up a drink. And I was of the same mindset. So mix that in with bipolar depression 
and suicide ideations and you get something completely insane. I want to tell you that there's another way. There's another way to live your life. I have been there and I'm probably going to go through another depression. This is ongoing. It doesn't stop. But the more that we talk about it, the more that we open up, the more that we are honest with ourselves and with our loved ones, the fastest way we can get help. So please reach out to any one of these hotlines so that you can get help. These are the numbers in Kenya. It's suicide hotlines that you can call. Please reach out to them. What I suggest that you do if you're having any of these thoughts, one, know that you're not alone. I have been there and I constantly go back there. Secondly, you're not well right now. Don't listen to what that voice is telling you. Instead, especially if you have made plans, tell someone close to you, tell someone that you can trust, or call any one of those numbers that I have put on the screen or in the description box below. Call someone, tell someone immediately what you're about to do. You just need someone in your corner. You just need someone to walk you off the ledge. And the third thing to remember, literally one day at a time. We're not doing this whole life all at once. We're not thinking until we're 60. We're not thinking until we're 80. We're not thinking until we're 100. We're not even thinking about tomorrow. Let's just get through today. And if we can't get through till this evening, let's just get through this afternoon. Let's just get through the next hour. Let's just make it. I hope that this video was helpful to you. Please hit subscribe. Please like and please share this video so that we can get this awareness out there. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. Until next time.